Cheryl's, Cheryl's ready. Cheryl's ready. Are there things we can do now? Are there things we can do now that will prepare us for what's next? So that's what we're in. We're preparing. And I really am. I'm being really, really intentional here. And everything we're doing, we're preparing for something fresh. We're preparing for something new in our existence as a body of Christ. And I pray that individually and corporately that you would really just, just dig into this and say, Lord, come on, I want to be intentional in this move for as a, corporately and in my personal life. So the first thing we talked about was declutter. Say declutter. How many are still decluttering? Yeah, me too. Honest to goodness, I tell you. So you got to declutter. And he said, Moses is dead. And he, he says, after Moses died, God came to Joshua and said, hey, hey, Moses is dead. Well, he said, I know that. But you see, there's something in that. He wants you to pay attention. And I'll tell you this. Moses cannot take you into the promised land. Moses represented the law. The law could not take you in. Joshua, if he was around today, we'd call him Jesus. That's how his name would be pronounced. And you see, Jesus, only Jesus can take you into the new covenant. It's only Jesus who can take you into the promise. So you got to realize Moses is dead. And if you're unpacking, uh, or if you've got things in your life or concepts or philosophies or ideas about God that aren't right I, I just get rid of them cast them down boom if you're living out of an old covenant theology throw it out because you need to bathe yourself in the reality of a new covenant because Moses is dead then you got to determine it's courage it was courage 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 be bold and be very courageous one act of courage can open the door to significant transformation just one act of courage can change the world and often we think it's got to be some amazing act like I dove on a grenade or I did something incredible or you know it, it's not I mean, like one lady just stayed in the seat in the bus and would not move. And she didn't that day say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change the world. They're going to put this bus in a museum. That wasn't how she started out her day. But one act of courage, because you just got core values and beliefs and who you are and your identity, that courage can change the world. And be bold. You're not going to possess. You're not going to step into unless you have that attitude, that courageous attitude to move ahead. Winston Churchill said, courage is rightly esteemed. It's the first of human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees all others. You gotta be courageous. So then we stepped into derive. This is Pastor Zach, he was struggling all week trying to find a D word to follow along with the outline and he, he came up with derive. How many, are, how many are big on derive? You, you say that every day, right? Derive, but derive means to take or to obtain from a particular source. Say source. See, I'm determined that I, there's a source, there's, there's a foundation for my life. I, I'm drawing from something, it's animating me, and derive is very, very important to find the origin or a particular source. So derive, we must be settled in the reality of Jesus' resurrection as the source and the spring of our life, future, and our inheritance before we can keep going. You need to be baptized in third day realities. Hello! So many third day realities. All over the Bible, there's three things. The third day, he changed the water and the wine. On the third day, they crossed over. They said, uh, let my people go a three day journey into the wilderness so they can party with me. Three is a powerful principle. Jesus Christ, the Lord, the way, the truth, the life. Everywhere in the Bible, there's these three things, this pattern. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's a principle of three. It's a principle that my life is animated by resurrection power every moment of the day. Now I heard last week it was really hot in here and you guys were all getting sleepy and dopey. So I got in here today, it was 15 and I had to turn the boilers on and I don't know, the thermostat's not communicating with the boilers for some reason, so we've either got cold or hot. But I didn't turn the boiler off, so it's going to continue to get hot while I preach. So if you're feeling dopey and sleepy, wake up! Okay, that's good. All right. Don't, don't do that. All right. Joshua 1, 11 says, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions together. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Three, prepare yourself. Three days. I mean, not today, not tomorrow. Three days. Jesus was risen early on the third day. We, there are seven days, 7,000 years. Here we are in the resurrection aspect of it. We're in the early in the third day. A day is a year as a thousand years is a day. We are in the third day right now of resurrection life. We are in the third day. We are stepping right into early on the third day. Jesus rose early on the third day. I believe Jesus is going to come back early on the third day. And here we are in that third millennium 
millennium after the, the, the new covenant was, was put in place. And in this third day, we're going to experience a wild outpouring of God's purpose and power. And it's really important that we know what time it is, and we're living in that right now. So get ready to cross over. Here's another third day. Zach gave a whole bunch, but here's one of my favorites, and it's in Esther. It says, now it happened on the third day. Say the third day. It happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and she stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house and she found favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther his golden scepter and it was in is very courageous because if you were not invited in that culture in that day, if the king had not invited you to come, if you came into his presence without an invitation, he could kill you. He could wipe you out. How dare you come into the presence of the king without an invitation? So she was taking her life at risk. She literally said, if I die, I die. But I'm going to go and I'm going to approach the king. Even though I'm not invited, I'm going to prepare myself. And on the third day, she went into the presence of the king. On the third day, she went in to the presence of the king. And he held out his scepter to her, which meant favor. I receive you. He held out his scepter to her. Then Esther went near, and she touched the top of his scepter, said, What do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. Woo! I mean, I'm not sure if I'm going to be received. I mean, he could just say, Off with her head. You're done. Out. But she risked everything, and she went in because there was a plan, and Mordecai had put a plan in place to destroy all the Jews, but she said, "Ah, for such a time as this, I'm going to put it all on the line. And on the third day, she went into the presence of the king, and on the third day, he stretched out his scepter, and he said, I offer you up to half the kingdom. Amazing boldness and amazing courage on the third day. Well, I'll tell you something. Luke chapter 12, 32, the king of glory, the king of kings, he says, do not fear, little flock, for it's the father's good pleasure to give to you half the kingdom. You know what it says? It says it's the father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom. Please, settle down. It's the father's good pleasure, folks. It's the Father's good pleasure. He is the King of kings. It's the Father's good pleasure to pour and bestow upon you kingship, to cause you to be a royal priest, to cause you to be one through whom he's going to bridge all his purposes in the earth. He's going to bring all things to bear. He's going to bring his kingdom into expression through you. He's not holding out one little bit. He's giving you all the resources of his kingdom to bring about his will in the earth. And we're living in that day right now. We're living in that day. We're crossing over in this day into a place where we're going to put a demand on his power and presence like never before. We're not waiting for him. He's waiting for us to get a revelation of how much he has invested in us, of how great and how glorious our inheritance is. Got an amen over there. Got a yes. Got a great. Got a, got a yeah. Got a, okay. Good, good, good. All right. So now we're going to move into Discover, all right? So that was just a recap. Say, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, Discover. You ready? Discover. Joshua chapter 2. Now, I love this chapter. Joshua chapter 2. We're talking about moving in and possessing the land that God has promised us. And before we do that, a whole chapter is devoted to this one event. I mean, when God wants to take a whole chapter in the middle of speaking about his people possessing the promise, when he wants to take a whole chapter to share something in this whole narrative, it's got to be really, really important. So what happens here? This whole chapter, he says, go view the land, especially Jericho. They sent 12 spies publicly. Pick out someone from your tribe to go do it publicly. Everybody knew spies were going to check out the land the first time they were going to cross over. But this time, Joshua privately took two people and said, you guys go quietly, go privately. And I want you to go view the land, especially Jericho. And he said, so they went and they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab. Now, why did they do that? Because, you know, if you watch, like, you know, spy movies and stuff like that, where are you going to get the goods from? You're going to get it in a house of ill repute. That's where you go where all the people talk too much and they say stuff they shouldn't. That's where you go if you really want to get the goods on what's going on. 
That's the way I see it. So anyways, they went to the house of a harlot named Rahab and they lodged there. I mean, they stayed there. And then he said, know that the Lord has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on all of us. So they're there and then they find out that spies are there. So the king starts looking for them. But Rahab tells them, says, listen, I know who you are and I want you to know this, that everybody is already terrified of you. Everybody has heard about you. Everybody knows that your God is God. And if you're wondering what's happened over here, what's going on here is everybody here is terrified that you're coming to possess the land. I want you to know this, that the devil is terrified. The devil's terrified that we're moving. The devil can't believe we want to buy a bigger space. We want to buy more land. We want to plant churches. The devil's been passing out volume to all of his little demons and saying, settle down, it's going to be okay. They're terrified of the forceful advance of the church right now. And that's, in part of the recon, that's what they found out. They found out that these people are already beat. I mean, when you get some recon and you find out that the person I'm competing against is already whipped, how awesome is that? What do we know about the devil? He is already defeated. He is powerless against the body of Christ. We already know that, folks. Our inheritance is assured. He lies to us and tells us, no, it's going to be hard. But here's the truth. He is whipped. And that's what we want to hear. We want to hear that he is whipped. Now, Joshua 2.13, I'm not going to read the whole chapter because that would just take too long. But look at this. This is from the NIV. It says, here's what she says. They said, listen, thank you so much. I mean, the soldiers came and you hid us in the roof structure. You opened up the roof structure and hid us in the roof structure. They came looking for us and they couldn't find us. Thank you for what you've done. And she says, now I'm going to let you out the window. And they say, hey, what can we do for you? She said, man, you guys just took all the wealth of Egypt a few years ago. So could you drop me a few million of gold bars? Could you kind of put some money in my retirement savings plan? I mean, can you... They're saying, what can we do for you? Thank you for what you've done for us. And she's answering them now, and she's saying, here's what I want done for me. Here's what she says. I want that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them, and that you will save them from death. What do you want? I want my family saved. What do you want? I want my family saved. This chapter is tucked into possessing the promises of God, a whole chapter to outline this, that there was a woman of ill repute who had one passion and one desire. She wanted her family saved. I want my family saved. You know where we're going, where we are? You know what's happening out there? You know what the cry is of every mother, every father, every person where we're headed? You know what? The enemy is defeated. That's what we know. But here's what else we know is going on in the hearts of every life there. You know what they want? I want my family saved. Where we're going, there's people already prepared. They're already saying, help me. My family is broken. My marriage is falling apart. My, my kids are, are off on trips on drugs. There's, my world is a mess. I don't know what's going on. Somebody please save me. That's what's going on. That's the cry of the people that we are approaching. That's the cry of the people that are actually around you every day. The enemy is already defeated. The people you work with, you know, if you could peel back and see what's really going on in their lives, there's a cry in their hearts, save me, save my family. It may be look like other stuff. It may be, you know, manifesting in all kinds of other ways. But really deep down in the heart of every single person is save me. Save my family. Isn't that exciting? Because here's what's really exciting. The enemy's defeated. They're all crying out, save me. And we've got a message of power that delivers and totally sets free. <laughs> Shh, easy on the clapping. There's a couple people just kind of. <laughs> here's what they said. Bind this line of scarlet cord. Bind this. Bind it, bind it, bind it, bind it. Oh, hang it out the window, bind it. Bind this line of scarlet cord according to your words, so be it. What you have said, what you desire, it will happen. Truly, the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands. 
God has given us London as our possession. All the broken, all the hurting, all the pain that's out there. There's no other plan, folks. There's not some other plan. God's not trying to work through some other vehicle because tired of trying to use the church. He has completely bound himself to us that we would get the job done. There's no other plan. Joshua 6, 23, and the young man who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all that she had. So that's moving ahead a little bit just to show you that she hung that scarlet cord out the window and went, this is amazing, Jericho, it was a massive city, they could have chariot races around the top of the walls. I want you to see that, imagine that. The walls are so thick and they are so big that they could have chariot races, several chariots racing around the top of the wall. This is a big city. And this is where God takes them. He says, I'm going to have you cross the Jordan in flood stage. Well, if you wait a few months, it's only a stream. I want you to do it in flood stage because I want everything I do through you to be a miracle. I want you to go in flood stage. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the biggest, nastiest group of people, the hardest obstacle that you could possibly see. That's what we're going to take first. Yes. And they're in there, and she's got a window view. She's got a mountain view apartment. So sure enough, right there in the wall of this great pink lake, could you imagine her when the people are out there marching around, and then all of a sudden the seventh day, they and they shout to the Lord. Everything fell apart. Can you imagine being in Rahab's home, and everything around you has fallen to pieces, but your home stands firm. Wow. Her home stood firm. Everything she had, everyone who was in her home. She's, what did she want? I want my whole family to be saved. Everyone who got in the room, everyone who got engaged in the covenant, everyone who embraced the promise, everyone who came in line with the bloodline hanging out the window, every single one of them was totally safe from a massive destruction. Hey! Hey! They went, they brought them out, they all came out. It's so amazing, such a great story. Ephesians, we want to nail this whole thing to Ephesians. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That bloodline, all you got to do, Rahab, is hang a bloodline, hang a red line, hang a scarlet cord out your window, and if you have faith alone in the scarlet cord, you and your household will be saved. It's the blood. It's the blood alone. It's the finished work of the cross. That's all that's necessary to have absolute, total forgiveness and a revelation of every good thing that God has blessed us with. In Ephesians, it says, we were dead and we were doomed and we were dominated, but we came to Christ and in him, he has made us alive. He has raised us up and he has seated us with him in heavenly places. Again, these triplets, these three things, it's everywhere in scripture what God does for us. He made us alive. He raised us up and he has seated us right now with him in heavenly places. I'm not trying to get there. I'm already there. I'm reigning and ruling in every aspect of my life. And I just want to enforce that now everywhere I go. All right, two primary results of the recon. I've already talked about it, but the first thing you get is confidence. God is faithful to his promise. He's already given you the land. So you find out that, I mean, you shouldn't be terrified. You should be bold because the enemy is already defeated. The enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. I'm gonna lift my voice in victory. I'm gonna make your praises loud. The enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. I'm gonna lift my voice in victory. I'm gonna make your praises loud. Wow, sorry, I should have been to the worship team meeting. We could have put that one in the set, you know. But Tell you folks, that's the truth. We're not trying to defeat him. The enemy has been defeated. Now, when you do your recon, when you get into the word, when you jump into the promise of God, you find a, man, I'm not fighting to get stuff. I'm just plowing through to receive stuff. This is so awesome. You know, the next thing you realize, though, is compassion because you will encounter broken lives that need to experience redemption. And that's what the spies found out. They found out we've already won, and they found out there's people who need to be set free. And that's what this whole possession thing is. We got to prepare our hearts to have eyes to see the brokenness around us. We got to have eyes to see that. So Rahab, her name literally means liberty. 
that's what her name means, liberty, or a large space, or wide open space. Her, that's what her name means. So a woman with few social rights, she was a woman, she was a Canaanite. The Canaanites were wicked people. And you say, you Canaanite. I mean, they were considered a wicked people. She was a prostitute. She wasn't just a prostitute. She was a brothel owner. And yet here's the other thing. She was a believer. She was a believer. She was a believer. She bound the scarlet cord. She believed that what they said, they said, according to your word, she said, let it be unto me. There's all kinds of Rahabs out there. There's all kinds of people crying out, liberty, freedom, open space in my life, help me. There's all kinds of that out there right now. And that's what we're looking to see. So three things. You ready? I'm going to give you three things. Number one, your history is irrelevant. Your past is irrelevant. Your background is irrelevant. Your family line is irrelevant. I don't care what your ancestors did or who they are. It says the blood has delivered me free from the empty way handed down by my forefather. The blood of Jesus has set you free. Well, I come from a line of blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter because now you come from a line of champions. You come from a line of victorious people. Your DNA has been changed altogether. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter where you came from. The blood of Jesus will re-engineer your life. It'll master you and bring you into the kingdom. And you are a child of God. Hallelujah. We're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant in a few weeks because they put the Ark in the water but in front of them. And the Ark is this, this big gold chest. And in the gold chest, there were three things. There was, there was manna, and there was the law, the, the Ten Commandments, and there was Aaron's rod that budded. All of those things are there, though, and they all represent failures of the people of God to believe and trust Him. They all represented things where, where they failed, where they couldn't do it. And you know, on top of it, though, on the lid, they put something called the mercy seat. And once a year, one priest went in with the blood of one lamb, and he atoned for the sin of all the people. He put blood on the mercy seat, and he put blood before the mercy seat, and the blood set the people free. Their sins were atoned for and gone until they had to do it again next year. But they were so excited, their sins were gone. Jesus did it once and for all. He went to the very, he is the propitiation of our sins. The word propitiation means mercy seat. He is the mercy seat for every failure, every ugly thing. And there's a mercy seat on top of failure. There was a time when they decided to lift the mercy seat and see what's inside. And when they lifted up the mercy seat to see what's inside, do you know what happened? People died. The mercy seat, it's where it is. It's fixed forever. Jesus, your mercy seat, is fixed on every issue of your life. He's fixed on your past. He's fixed on every failure. He's fixed in every root of your life that is determined by failure. The mercy seat and the blood of Jesus on the mercy seat speaks for you. It speaks liberty and it speaks freedom. Don't go lifting it up and looking inside. Well, back in 1994, I did this. Don't do that. Don't, don't go back to what the dead man did. Don't go back to what you did. Don't lift and look inside and say, remember when I did that? Stay the mercy seat fixed. Let the blood of Jesus be established over your life. It's not by works, but it's because of his faithfulness. Alone, in Jesus' name, I need a tissue. Oh, look at that. Wow. I got some perspiration in my eye. Must be getting warm in here. Our history doesn't matter. There is no limit to his grace. Don't try anything else. Don't try to lift the lid and add anything to your redemption. Jesus is the propitiation for your sins. He is the mercy seat. The blood alone has absolutely set you free. Don't go digging into your past and digging into the nonsense. That's just going to get ugly. And you open up things that you don't want to do. Let the mercy seat seal it once and for all. I am a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. Number two, his blood is powerful. There's power in the blood of Jesus. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what it is, there's power in the blood. It covers everything. And what I love about this is it says, bind it. Say, bind it. Bind it. And you got to have faith in this blood. Yeah, the blood has been shed. But you see, the blood for it to be effective has to be applied. See, they shed the blood of the lamb, but then they had to go apply it to the mercy seat. Jesus' blood was shed, but for it to have any virtue or any place in your life, you have to apply the blood. The blood is powerful, but the blood has to be applied. And I love what they said to her. They didn't say, hang it out there. They didn't say, just, just toss it out there. He said, bind it. Bind it. Bind yourself. 
to the blood of Jesus. Bind yourself to the finished work of the cross. Bind yourself to this. So you bind yourself to that, nothing will be able to pull you away from it. As a family, bind your family to the blood of Jesus. You go off to university and they start teaching you all kinds of nonsense. It doesn't matter what they do if you have bound yourself to the bloodline. Nothing else can get on you when you have bound yourself to the power of the finished work of the cross. Nothing can get on you when you bind yourself to the reality that his blood has absolutely, totally set you free. And you can't just have a, a mental assent to that. You've got to bind yourself to that. You've got to have a faith where that works in your life. Where That's not I hope so, but that is, you know, it's not like bind it in there, fix it in there so nothing will take it away because your salvation depends on when they come in and when everything falls apart, is the bloodline still there? Her whole future depended on that being bound to her window. I don't know if she went back every day and said, it's bound. And she checked it and she watched over it. I don't have to go watch over it because I know Jesus did it once and for all. And I bind myself to the faith of Christ. I bind myself in the faith of God. And I know that the blood has totally, it has power to set me free. It has power to animate my life. It has power to move me forward in the resurrection life of God. You got to bind yourself. What happened there? I must have hit something. Did I hit something there? Wow. How many were traumatized when the thing went sideways? <laughs> Forgive them, Lord. Our history is irrelevant. His blood is powerful. Say, bind it. Thank you. All right. Our future is secure. Our future is secure. I was talking to Sammy at the door. I said, we put an offer in this place. I don't know if we'll get it. I don't know. After we put the offer in, I went to bed that night and I said, oh my goodness, what if we get it? What if they say, yes, we've bought this church and we're doing another church. We're doing a renovation and what are we going to do here? God, what have I done? And I said, I don't know what's going on, Sammy. What if they say yes? She says, what are you freaking out about? I mean, you just got to trust Jesus. He knows what he's doing. God's got it all under control. I'm like, does he? She said, bind it, Pastor. Your history is irrelevant. The blood is powerful. You know what? Our future is absolutely, totally secure. I don't have to be anxious about a single thing. Amen? Amen. Your future is secure. You got the bloodline of a champion. Matthew chapter 1, 5 and 6 and 16, it says, Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab. Wow. Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. Wow! This woman who ran a brothel, for goodness sake, she didn't just get set free. She was brought into the very redemptive line of Christ. Woo! She's the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus! Isn't that exciting? It's not just to get anybody to skin in my teeth and, you know, thank God our lives didn't fall apart. Are you kidding? You get pulled into an opportunity that is so immense that every single you, look at you, look at you, look at you. You have the bloodline of a champion in you. There are the same DNA that brings freedom to the whole world. Christ in you is the hope of glory. The same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead, it's at work in your mortal body. You are a carrier of divine nature. You are a dispenser of heavenly favor. Woo! Praise God! And my future is absolutely secure. Wow. Wow, look at what a future. Hebrews eleven thirteen is faith provided a way of escape for Rahab. What did Rahab do? She nailed it. She bound that cord. She put her faith in that cord. She hung it out the window, and it was a scarlet thread because it represents that scarlet thread that goes all the way through the beautiful book of the Word of God, all the way to you. That same scarlet thread reaches you all the way through history. There's a scarlet thread that we can bind ourselves to that will deliver us, not only deliver us, but bring us into an incredible, glorious inheritance. Rahab, by faith, she avoided destruction of the unbelievers because she received the Hebrews in peace peace. Revelation 1, 5, and 6, to him who ever loves us and has once and for all loosed us and freed us from our sins, to him who loves us always, unconditionally and fully, who loves us and who has loosed us and freed us from our sins by his own blood, and he has 
formed us. Or another translation says he has made us. He has formed us into a kingdom of a royal race. We are priests to his God and his father. Then it says to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. See, how's he going to do the glory part? Us. The glory part is God loves us. He freed us. He has baptized us. He has crowned us with his glory and majesty. He has given us a message to be a bridge of a revelation of the goodness of God to a lost world. And what's going to happen? What will result? To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's how it's all going to happen. It's us. God, how are you going to do it all? You. How are you going to change the world? You. How are you going to fix this mess? You. Are there any enemies out there? Yes, but they're all defeated. They're all toothless. They're all terrified. They're all wondering what's taking you so long. Is there anybody who needs help? Yes. And their hearts are prepared. They're already crying out, save me and my whole family. There is a multitude right now prepared for freedom and deliverance. Ha. Ha. Ha, what possibilities are waiting to be released in my life if I would bind myself to the scarlet cord? What around me awaits healing and recovery if I would only just bind myself to the scarlet cord? Come on, why don't you stand with me? Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ha. Oh, God. Oh, God. That's all the believers are praying right now. There's a, there's a scarlet cord right now. There's a scarlet cord that speaks freedom and redemption for you. Maybe you've come in today and you wandered in and who are these people? Saw a new sign on that old church. What's going on? Maybe somebody invited you. Maybe you're watching online. But I tell you, there's, a, there's hope for you. There's a cry in your heart, save me. There's a cry in your heart, there's brokenness in my life. I need to be saved. I need someone to reach out to me. Well, right now, we're reaching out. Right now, there's an opportunity for you to bind that scarlet thread in your life, to bind that cord in your world, to bind yourself to the one who will never, ever fail you. Bind yourself to the finished work of the cross. Bind yourself to the power in the blood of Jesus. Because it totally sets you free. It doesn't matter where you've been. doesn't matter what's involved. doesn't matter what your past is at all. Whoever you are, if you got a messed up past, yes, you qualify. This is especially for you. You know, if you got family members or people in your world, if you've been a believer all your life and you've been, oh God, are you going to touch my family? Will you save my family? If that's the one thing, God, I don't care about riches, I don't care about wealth, I don't care about anything else, but I want my family to be saved. This is a promise to you that it will be you and your household will be saved. Just bind yourself to that scarlet cord. He will not fail you. I tell you, God's ready to act in a big way on our behalf. Listen, you're here today. So, you know, I've never, I've never just embraced that. I've never embraced Jesus as the only way. I've never embraced the simple message of the blood of Jesus and just believing in him. Just that alone totally sets me free. I've never just totally embraced that. But today I want to say I want Jesus. I want him to be my Lord and to be my Savior. I want to trust in the finished work of the cross. The cross alone, not other stuff, not the cross and do these 25 things, but him alone. I want to make him once and for all the Lord of my life. Listen, if that's you today, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three, just so you know when to put your hand up because I want you to put your hand up because I'm going to pray with you. But if that's you and you say, I want him to be Lord of my life, when I count to three, you just go, yes, that's me. You ready? One, two, three. Three. Just put your hand up really high. Really high so I can see it. Anyone at all. Anyone at all. All right. What if you're here today and say, you know what? I, I, I got some family members. I cry out today like Rahab. I want my household to be saved. And if you got some concerns and say, man, I, I really want to see my world just totally aligned I want to see them come absolutely in line with the finished work of the cross. Now, if you'd say, hey, pastor, pray for my family today. 
Put your hand up. Just say, pray for my family today. Thank you. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, what an amazing story this is. You took up a whole chapter in this book about possessing the promises. You took up a whole chapter to show us the story of Rahab, a person who was broken, messed up, who, you know, it would look like, wow, that's going to be tough to redeem that situation. But, Father, nothing's too hard for you. Nothing at all. You see, see nothing but an opportunity to show incredible love. And here's someone who saw an opportunity for family and household salvation. And would you save me and my family? Father, we cry out and we believe that you are the God of gods. We believe in your word. Rahab got her prayer answered. We see the jailer, he got his household, was all saved that day said, you and your household will be saved. Well, Father, we put a demand on that word right now. We plead the blood of Jesus over our families. We plead the blood of Jesus over our brothers and our sisters, our uncles and our aunts. We plead the blood of Jesus over parents. We plead the blood of Jesus over our kids. We plead the blood of Jesus over our kids are, you know, subject to so much nonsense these days, but we bind right now. We bind them to the bloodline. We bind them to that work. We bind them to the finished work of the cross and nothing shall be able to separate them from your love. So Father, we loose right now a great revelation of household salvation. We now by faith call it into manifestation because you are a good, good God. Father, we pray as we transition, we pray for this community that we're in. We pray for the community we're moving to. We pray for the many communities where we're gonna plant churches. Father, we hear the cries of people, come and save me. Come and save me. Father, we believe that people are going to be so impacted by a message of your love and of your good news that we're going to see multitudes come into the kingdom. Father, we command your blessing on all that we're doing and all that we put our hand to. Father, we command your blessing. And we ask you, Father, to open more doors, to, to just give us opportunities to make your name famous and to share your love. We declare London is saved. We declare London is blood washed and totally set free. We declare your goodness all over the city in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.